filter, water sprinkler. I'm gonna send it back to the top. All right. Well, I'm over here at Mike Ankeny's house. He's gonna tell us about some secret baits from Raystown Lake that he's that he's learned over the years. Hey, Tyler's welcome to my house. I'm just gonna give, go through and give you what my knowledge is and my history of this this bait. And the way I discovered or came to know this bait is uh, from a friend of mine, Junior Dixon. And uh, we were fishing at nighttime. We would fish a lot at night for stripers and we're fishing for stripers. And he said, uh, my dad uses this one lure and he catches big bass all the time with it. And they're like, what lure? <laughs> so he shows me this thing and he's got a few of them. And, and uh, just the, the way my personality is, I just happened to have one of these <laughs> right? by the end of the trip. And you know, I just started using it because I'm in a, I mainly fish for stripers at the time, but I just started getting into bass fishing and then joined a club. And, uh, I started using this lure and <clears throat> in the beginning is, well, till today it's, it can be amazing, but at the time, these fish never saw this thing. This thing will get on top and, and if you ever seen a shad in distress, it gets on top and it goes back and forth and that's what I tried to always emulate with this. In the beginning is, uh, I'm talking like mid 80s I guess, towards the end of the 80s, in there somewhere, I can't exactly remember exactly what time it was, but the, the tournament weights for five, five fish were generally, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 pounds was big. Fish this club tournament and I know I'm gonna hammer them because for like the previous week or two, all I did was throw this thing and it, it would, like your scanners now, you can look at it and you can see where the fish are. This thing would show you where the fish were because whether they ate it or not, they showed themselves on this thing. So you can go down the shoreline and you, and at the end of a shoreline, maybe a hundred yard stretch or something, I could tell you there was a school of large mass there, a school of small mass here, and the, they're hungry. <laughs> and it was, it was fun to find them. And the first club tournament that I used this and I come in with almost 19 pounds and, and that like sparked the interest of this lure. Uh, there was a gentleman who just by chance happened to see me catch several fish that day and he, he saw what this lure was and he immediately when he got home started calling everyone that he could possibly call in his Rolodex and, and the word got out. Through time and I made some adjustments and there has always been this fallacy in my mind of having to weight these things. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people wait. They'll get a lure and they'll immediately drill, start drilling holes in it. And then just like any other crankbait or hard plastic lures, you could have buy a dozen and three of them work or three of them are the best. And that's exactly the way this lure was. If you can hand me a light there somewhere, Tyler, I could sh share a little bit about what's going on here. If you can see this, I'm going to put this light behind this lure. And up front, there's there's a cavity in the front and the cavity in the back. And you can see this particular lure has a cavity in the front. And that's one solid piece of lead. And in the back is one solid piece of lead. Yeah. Yeah, you can see them right through there. And you'll, and you'll get you'll get some of these lures and there'll be like a bead up front or two or three beads up front and four and five beads in the back and uh, i'm sure it all depends on the weight but my i i just found through the through the years that when i find that this type of lure that has that solid weight in it that's that's the one i want that's the one that seems to be more productive and, and you can have you know you can adjust it and then get different actions out and I'm sure like make it make one like work better or work just the same but I'm just trying to let you know the history of this waiting business came around right <clears throat> so I see you got an extra an extra knot on the front I've seen some people put a lot of split rings I've even some snap rings people talk about but I see you got something going on a little different this I purposely didn't cut this knot off and I left that there because my next, when I'm going to use this lure, I'm going to cinch that knot up right there. And my like testing with this lure and using this lure, if you had that line tie like right here in the, in the, in the cusp of that 
ring, that's where you got the best action of this thing on the, and for the most part, I'm keeping this on the surface. I mean, every now and then I can, if you, if you let this go, it'll shimmer down, but I never wanted to fish this lure deep because I didn't have very many of them to begin with, and I didn't want to lose them. So, <laughs> I mean, it definitely I'm, makes sense. I'm getting bit on the surface, so you know, I didn't. I mean, I've used it under the surface and caught fish under the surface, but for the most part, I'm I'm putting it on the surface, and that was the purpose of that. Just through trial and error, the purpose of leaving that knot there and tying below it, it kept it at the optimum place where that knot should be, so I got the most action out of it. So your knot wouldn't slide the whole entire way to the no, top of that? it was impossible for that knot to get any further up there. That keeps it down far, and yeah, it keeps but, it off that nose, essentially. Yeah, yeah, it kept it off the nose. It's a heavy lure, and it, it was a notorious to catch a decent-sized fish on it and, and just even end up reeling the lure back because it would throw it. So what did you start doing? So I started putting another split ring on this back because once it's hooked, if it got hooked on this tail... And you put another split ring on there, it would give you another turn until it bound, there it bound. So without that extra split ring, you know, you're only going to get like half that turn on there before it bound. And when, when it binds up, that's what I feel when the fish gets off or has an opportunity to get off. Back to the weighting of this lure and what started the weighting of this lure. This lure became popular and because of supply and demand, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't open up a Cabela's magazine or a bass pro magazine and order this lure so it wasn't really readily available well there was a tackle store in huntington it was called fegley's and, uh, nick lambert was part of that store and ed price was part of that store they well they you know they're they're businessmen they know you know we need, we need some of these so one of them both of them whoever it was got a hold of a manufacturing where they had these molds and they ordered whatever they had to order or maybe five i don't know what the number was but i'm sure they had to order you know several hundred of these to get them made well when they came back they had real light beads in here almost like a hollow bead and they sure they had the lore but they didn't have the weight in it and when you when you would when you would you try to use one of their lures it would just lay on the surface and <laughs> actually like be a freaking light leaf on the water it didn't do anything <clears throat> and i don't know who who it was but someone figured out that need to put and at the time i had enough for myself i didn't have to mess with those things and actually didn't mess with them for a while but they, they figured out they would drill holes in here and they had weight seal it back up paint whatever and then you know with a proper weight in there they would get them to go back and forth and i've seen this lure you know sometimes it would be a subtle action and sometimes you could get this lure to go and big back and forth and if you ever see a wounded shad or a shad that busted away from his school you know they get on the surface and they you know they make that just like the what you're trying to do with wake bait imitations today and the example Heck yeah you got quite a Quite here. a variety pack here. Let's see if I can pick some out. Now, obviously, I can't look inside, you know, underneath that chrome, but I can show you. And these lures haven't been touched. These haven't been altered. But you can see here. Now this one has. Try to get the right angle here. Five beads. Four is there five or four there? Four beads in the back and it looks like a solid piece up front now i know this i have i have hundreds i really have, absolutely have hundreds of these i purchased 600 from a lady in, in, in uh, oklahoma from a, a taco store that was like going under business and she would sell them to me but i'm just going to go through here and show you the different you know, the different man whether it's a different manufacturer, maybe they ran out of the solid lead and decided to go to the beads. But here's one that has a solid front and then four beads are in the back. Here's one. One, two, three, four. This one has five beads in the front or in the back. And it looks like one solid one up front. Everyone in the every one of these lures in this box works good. Uh, everyone uh, this is an original, never touched. 
And probably a rare color. I very rarely see that. That thing has a real nice wobble to it. It's caught several fish. Let's see if I can find another we can look through here because there's here's one. This same Smoky Joe as this one. Now this is the one that had solid front and back. And we'll see what's in this one. Right, can you see Tyler? What's in that guy? Not yet. Okay. It's a few bigger beads up front, it looks like. And in the back, what do we got? Back. Nothing. Isn't that a nickel? Yeah. See, there's an, that's just from the... No one, no one ordered that, but... Like, everything in this box works. This is a box that ones that friggin... You know, just like your crankbaits or any other lures, you separate from the good from the bad. And through time, I separate from good from bad. Here's two. See what we got here. Look, there's one solid bead up front. Is there two smaller ones there by the nose? There's, uh, I see at least one, one small one. Right yeah, but there. we got one, for sure we got one bead in there, one big bead. Yeah, and then a whole row of beads. Yeah, there's four or five in that back. Yeah, at least five, maybe six. But, you know, whether rattles work or not, who knows? Some believe it does. I mean, I've caught them on rattles, I've caught them on no rattles. <laughs> but just we're just going through here and, and checking out just the different differences of this and here's another one i mean they look identical there's one that has a solid bead in the front you get a good angle there yeah i can't count how many's in there but uh, yeah but the, these two i mean i don't know if they came out of the same run maybe not i don't know Oh, I know this is like there's a weight difference between the, the two. Now, you, you know, if you really want to get into it, I mean, you can figure out whether this had a wider wobble because of X amount of weight here and there. But my, my point is, is the weight, why, I always heard, you know, got a blue striper. Is it weighted? <laughs> well, <laughs> the weighted was for the ones that freaking laid on top of the surface and looked like a leaf and had no action whatsoever. And, and I can remember drilling those out just to see what was in there, and they had like a like a hollow bead that was absolutely no weight to it at all. But I found out, you know, this is Optimum Hooks. I'm using 20, 25 pound mono, heavy shit. You know, those fish didn't seem to care, and you need you needed that heavy line, you needed that stretch of the mono, you needed that parabellum in your rod, you needed you needed a fast reel, and once you hooked to you know, once you hooked a fish, I and mean, I'm talking a bass, not a striper, whether large mouth or small mouth, once you hooked one, you didn't you didn't give them any you, no slack whatsoever. You you reeled them to the boat, and if it took drag, it took drag, but you're just like constantly reeling it back. And that's what I found out. That's what I found that uh, helped your catch ratio. This is like constant pressure on the thing. Keep them pinned. Keep them pinned. Now, stripers, and that's what that's what uh, Junior's father was using it for. And uh, I've caught fifty pounders, and, and we can probably put in some pictures here. Caught fifty pounders on these things. Yeah, you're not steady reeling <laughs> a 50 pounder back to the boat <laughs> and you know you're, you're not reeling a, a 20 pounder back to the boat uh, like you are a bass and it's a little different thing but the setup was the same the setup was like a crankbait rod a long crankbait rod that had a nice bed to the, from the from the reel to the tip and you, i used 20 25 pound mono i wanted mono in there and i used i've used braid i've used fluorocarbon and this is just just my findings you know i'm sure someone else has a you know way that they do things but that's basically the story of this lure nice it's, a, it's given me lots of pleasure that's for sure it's just, it was just fun to use this and still use it still will use it well thanks I appreciate for, that. thanks for stopping by tyler yeah man glad to share the story possibly get into something else all right. Now, and I don't know if there's other lakes that I just know, you know, from videos, and it seems to be predominant on race time. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. So you want to do some other ones? Yeah, we could do some more. <laughs>